did my All right, let's start again. A very disciplined audience. Everybody's back in the room for the round table on money laundering risk assessment for the public sector. My name is Edward Clemens. I'm a full professor at the VU University in Amsterdam. And before I was a full professor in Amsterdam, I used to work at the Research and Documentation Center of the Ministry of Security and Justice, and there we often had this discussion with policymakers. So, why do you need research? Um, and we always try to find common ground. So, sometimes research can really help policymakers, but they are in different businesses. So, we have all policymakers, practitioners here, evaluators. And they have the perspective of the public sector and the important things they have to do. And sometimes, only sometimes, science can help a little bit. And for me, this is why I like science, to make the world a little bit better and to make policy also a little bit more rational. But we have to understand that these are different traits. So the question of science is, well, what are the empirical facts um, and in policy, there's much more. There are empirical facts, but there are also normative aspects. What do you value most? What does the minister want? And is there public support for certain things? You could focus on certain sectors, but there are all kinds of interests that you also have to take into account. So it's a much more complicated process. You've seen all the risk assessments. You think science is complex, but I can assure you policy is much more complex than what we do. So it's good to introduce now the, the policy makers. To the right, there's Isabella Fontana from the Italian Ministry of Economy and Finance. There's Marco Rehorst from the Ministry of Security and Justice in the Netherlands. There's Mick Beatty from the National Police Chiefs Council and he's focusing on uh, financial crime, coordinates uh, nationally the financial crime um, in the UK. And to my right, uh, left is, uh, or to your right, is uh, Sergei Teterukov from the Financial Action Task Force. So what I would like to do is first uh, ask some questions to Italy, the Netherlands, and the UK uh, about the risk assessment instruments that we try to develop or the methodology because this project ERIM is really a methodological project. Can we make the risk assessment a little bit more quantitative and if we want to do that, how can we do it? So it's a pilot study, it's not a risk assessment, it's a kind of methodology and the things we have done now is look at variations in risk between certain geographical areas. So especially Italy and the UK, these are interesting countries because they have real regions. And the Netherlands, well, it's not a country. It's so small that if you talk about regions, well, it's, 
it's not that interesting. So we made uh, the choice to do for the Netherlands the focus on business sectors, and we did that in Italy as well. But then the major question for policymakers and practitioners would be, well, what is the relevance of knowing differences in risk between certain areas that you know that in the south of Italy, but also in other provinces, the risk is higher, or that in certain sectors, economic sectors, there is a higher risk of money laundering. What does that mean for, well, policy or for police investigations or prevention activities? So we like to follow the order of the, of the presentations of the scientists. So we go first to Italy, then we go to the Netherlands, and then we go to, uh, to the UK. UK is last, but that's because they are the most important country, perhaps. <laughs> Not because of Brexit, so. <laughs> and Italy is the first because it's also the, a very important country. So, Isabella, could you reflect a little bit on, well, the potential use of differences in risk between um, regions and business sectors? Thank you. I'm glad to be here and uh, I would like to give a special thank to Professor Savona and to Transcrime because the, we need so much the, the help of the science and the help of uh, academics and there are so few academics that are so specialized in, uh, in tools that are very very important, very relevant for policy makers and the money laundering is not so specific. As you have seen from the, from the slides, from the presentation, money laundering is a an, um, transversal crime, horizontal crime. It's a very ancient crime. It's a, the, the, the mother of all financial crimes because every, every, every offense that you can imagine may have uh, revenues. And these revenues goes abroad, goes to other regions, goes everywhere. And there are so we envisage uh, to have gatekeepers, to have uh, obliged entities with uh, eyes and, uh, and ears to, 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 to catch the signals of anomaly conducts. And um, to have a map of the risk is very, very fundamental, not only to comply with FAT standards. Uh, we did this exercise in 2014. Uh, I work at the Treasury, at the Director of Prevention of Financial Crimes, we did this exercise because we, we did have this evaluation from FAFT with the collaboration of IMF. And so it was not stated in our rules at the time. It was just, you know, a, a first experimental pilot exercise also at governmental level. We only have uh, in the past years, and we continue to have a report to the parliament, an official report to the parliament, of all the activities by all the authorities in Italy that have done something uh, from uh, different perspectives, law enforcement, uh, FIU, Bank of Italy, supervisor, regulators. Uh, uh, so we have this kind of report to the parliament each year on money laundering. Why money laundering is so important in Italy? So important because we have uh, criminal organization in our territory. It's not, they were only national in the uh, 70s and they were uh, drug trafficking that was the main resources for these kind of criminal organizations. So they have massive, massive revenues from drug trafficking. Uh, uh, this kind of revenues uh, some, in, in some ways has to, you know, be legitimized. This is why money laundering is so important because gives uh, uh, true jobs, real jobs, gives legitimate revenues to other people that maybe doesn't, don't know that the original funds came from uh, homicides, came from criminal organization, came, came from uh, corruption, came from tax evasion, tra human trafficking. Now it's very actual, unfortunately, this human traffic side. And so um, money laundering is not, uh, you know, so technical uh, offense. It's the, 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 the offense you have to know as a government to, to have a trace of all the other offense that are in your country. Uh, luckily, we have um, a police force, financial police force, that was uh, uh, at the beginning of their history, the Guardia di Finanza, was uh, envisaged, was um, um, have the, the purpose to, to combat tax crimes. 
And, um, and uh, in the past years, they add the anti-money laundering purposes. And nowadays, there is also the financing of tenderness because we have not forget also the, the other kind of illicit flows that we have. And um, so in a certain sense, uh, the, 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 the fact that we have this kind of financial police, it gives the sense in Italy that uh, all these um, atheist crime have a, a, financial, a financial effect. The financial impact of money laundering on economies and the, and the, and the social, also social outcomes uh, is, uh, is very, very negative. And um, the map that uh, the study provides for is very useful for the next update of our national risk assessment. Because the first one was done uh, um, at the national level. As you can see, the, 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 the Italy is very fragmented in, uh, from um, various risk indicators. And, and so we, we appreciate very much to have this kind of maps, not only for policy regulators at the national level, because we have to do you know, one law, as it was the law for the country, but uh, mm, for supervisor, for example, because FAFT asked to supervise to do a supervision uh, based on uh, um, a risk. Um, a risk understanding. And so the geographical risk is, is the first one. The business sector too is very important. We didn't do this kind of uh, approach. Uh, we didn't have this kind of approach in the first, uh, in the first national risk assessment. We would like uh, to incorporate also that, that other kind of aspect in that uh, because it's very much linked to crime organization and to corruption too. So we are, um, we are very willing uh, to to have these new tools in our uh, future uh, update. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Then we move on to the Netherlands, which is also an important country, but very small, and that's why we didn't do the analysis on a regional basis, but only the business sectors. But perhaps uh, Marco Rehorst from the Ministry of uh, Security and Justice can reflect on both questions, regions, but especially for the Netherlands business sectors, what would be the use of, of knowing the differences in risks between different sectors? Well, thank you, Edward. Um, I would like to uh, start to comment on your first uh, uh, words you said about how policy advisors uh, uh, deal with academic uh, reports and researches. Uh, I see it as a sort of love-hate relationship. Uh, working as a pol policy advisor, you work in a political environment Sometimes it's very difficult to deal with a academic research uh, and you have to explain to the politics what the impacts are of the research. For instance, one research that was done in 2006, uh, it was calculated that in the Netherlands about 60 billion uh, uh, euro was laundered on a yearly basis. Um, There's a report out to from 2006. Um, in the Netherlands, approximately 200, 300 million on a yearly basis is confiscated. Every time, again, we have to uh, explain in Parliament how it is possible that 60 billion is laundered and only 200 million is confiscated. So that is a, a, a hate situation with the academics that made that report uh, and that estimate. Um, in this case, we have a, a, a love situation, I think. Um, we deal with a lot of money that is laundered. Uh, we, we, we acknowledge that. We don't know the, the exact amount. But we also deal with uh, a limited capacity with the supervisors, with the law enforcement authorities, uh, with the public prosecutor's office. So it is necessary, uh, already the FTF is, is, is demanding it, uh, to do a risk assessment, uh, to make sure that you, you put your capacity in, in the right uh, place and make them look in, in the right direction. That's what we need. Um, so therefore, a, 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 met a methodology that is developed within this pilot, we welcome very much. Uh, I think all countries are, are looking and searching how to, to best uh, 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 do a national risk assessment. Um, as said before, we are in the first uh, stages of our first national risk assessment. Um, this methodology will help us also to uh, get a grip on where the, 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 the potential risks are. Um, as you said, the, the, the Netherlands is a very small country. So uh, looking at region, that is not very, very uh, realistic for the Netherlands and has no added that value. Um, but looking at the public sector, that can, uh, can surely help, uh, um, especially for the obliged entities, 
to get a grip at the, and to focus where are the, are the risks um, and where to look. I do think this, this exercise that has been done in this project needs to be further developed. It has to be used by, uh, at the end, to oblige entities and perhaps the supervisors. Perhaps we can, can, can look in the future to take it a step further. But I think it's a very uh, a good start and it will certainly help us in the Netherlands to develop a risk assessment that will be uh, something of a, 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 a long term. Uh, developing, uh, looking at, at, at methodologies, what works, what doesn't work, uh, what needs to be improved, how can we improve it. So it's, it's in small steps uh, to eventually get a better grip on 60 billion laundered, uh, only 200 million confiscated. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We move now to the UK. In the analysis, Scotland was not there. It was only England and Wales, but the UK is bigger. Um, and we have, well, the ministries, but we also have the police, and they have different, uh, well, sometimes different tools to use. Um, but I want you to ask, uh, to answer the whole question also, also perhaps the prevention part of it. Um, well, to tell us a little bit more about what's the use of knowing these differences in risks between regions and business sectors. Um, <clears throat> thank you, thank you for, for inviting me along here today. Um, in, in the Police Chiefs Council, we've been, we've been very glad to support this work. Um, and in, in some respects, we're grateful for the work because if you, if you look at sort of traditionally in, in policing, it's a monopoly business. Normally they, they have sole, sole ownership of the problem and there's always been a culture in the past of we know what we're doing, we know how to do it. I think the climate's changing around that now. I think there's a recognition that we can no longer arrest ourselves out of problems. It's a multi-agency approach. It's a multi-government departmental approach, including social housing, social care, education, et cetera, et cetera. I think having recognised that, I think also that spills into the private sector and the interdependencies amongst all, the, all these agencies in the private sector, public sector, um, are all, you know, are, are all there. We, I come to you purely from a, from a law enforcement background. Um, my, my background is all about as a finance investigation, finance investigation, up to senior officer level. Um, and in the UK, if I, if I, if I look at policing as a, as a, as a one agency, um, in some countries you have national agencies who can deal with this. We have 43 police forces that are split into 10 regions. Each police force has a chief constable who has the discretion to dictate what his force does or doesn't do or her force. And equally within a region, there's a political board that determines their, their objectives, their priorities. Now, equally amongst that, you have national funding, which is split amongst these. And the competing demands means we're, dis we're fractured and disproportioned around some of the investigations we do. In the UK, we operate a, a strategy against what we call the four Ps, where we look to prevent, protect, prepare, and pursue in relation to that. If you start looking at the money laundering risk assessment we had, and, and Dr. Hopkins mentioned some of the flaws in that, it was a first attempt. We hadn't done that, really. And it, there were some good, good points in that, very, very qualitative and a very select stakeholder audience based on the, the political muscle and power of the, of the regions and some, and some of the, uh, the national agencies. But in terms of what I'm just talking about, breaking down resources and, and, and finances, the, the, the useful, the, the geographical work is really, really useful. Um, if, if I can give you an example, we have a, a, a major problem in the UK around property prices in London and suggestion that Eastern European drug lords can't, and criminals are funding heavily into that. Do we know the extent of that risk? And, and we talked this morning on some of the questions were around beneficial ownership. That's really, really useful. And equally, maybe taking that one step further to the beneficial ownership, the priority jurisdictions of where that's coming from. And we think we know, but do we know, going back to this assumption we know best um, based on majority of quantitative data. You get things like in the UK, the south of England is very, very affluent, very large, you know, expensive houses, but it's predominantly um, an elderly population down there. So geographical data can help in, they're very vulnerable to certain t crime types um, and fraud related. So this, this data can help in the prevent side of it or the protect in terms of our crime prevention. You cannot investigate the level and volume of some of that crime. So your strategy will be to protect and prevent and use mass methods of trying to stop people falling victim to that. 
So the geographical data around those sorts of things is really, really useful in determining where we can apply resources uh, and, and use those. Equally, when we, when we try to sort of convince certain areas or certain groups that they have a problem, it's not a problem in other areas, but actually things like some of the objectives now in law enforcement, we don't necessarily always go for a criminal justice outcome where we try to put somebody in prison. There's often other options you look for. And in some cases, um, your tactical or your objective may be to reduce the risk or manage the risk, the law enforcement risk, just by disruption or something along those lines. So the, the strategy is whole based on disruption. Well, disruption can have a displacement effect. So if we're going to disrupt in a particular area, it will manifest itself in another area. Having these risk assessments in advance will, one, allow us to get ahead of the game and start preparing resources and allocating that, but also factoring the tactical objectives we do, do around that. So in terms of that, I think it's, you know, we're in a changing environment in policing because traditionally we targeted um, money, uh, money laundering through drugs trafficking and things like that. There's a real shift in law enforcement now to um, things like child sex exploitation, cyber, um, those kind of offending. And, you know, in terms of money laundering, some of those don't have money laundering connotations in, in a great extent. But actually, if we're going to abandon, abandon is probably too strong a word, if we're going to sort of redeploy a lot of resources into those areas, because they are high risk, we can't just, you can't throw, the, there's a terminology in the UK, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And all this sort of, the data that's been provided by, by this kind of work is the the quantitative data really supports the quality data, which historically we've always tended to work towards. All right, thank you very much for your comments on the model. And as you could see in the presentations, we are quite modest about the model. It's a, a pilot, it's a methodology, it needs to be developed further, and it can be, well, perhaps a helpful instrument in the wider context of risk assessment. It's not a national risk assessment, so policymakers think, well, there's a model, we are ready, we're ready for the FITF to come to town. Well, uh, you're not, because this is a, well, a wider um, risk assessment, and many people dream of the FITF, so many policymakers have nightmares, perhaps, the FITF is coming next year, or, but actually the FITF is a very important organization in uh, helping uh, countries to keep their own promises and work together and present well and discuss how far they've uh, uh, developed in terms of anti-laundering risk assessment. So that's why I'm really glad that uh, Sergei is here uh, to speak on also the, the risk assessment and the, the ideas behind risk assessment. And I wanted to ask you, what is the role of risk assessment in the overall uh, evaluations of the Financial Action Task Force that is very important for countries to, to well, go further down the road of anti-money laundering risk assessment and risk measures. Thank you, Mr. Clemens. Uh, I'm also very glad to be here and uh, happy, very happy to be back in Italy again. Uh, I like this country very much, both personally and from the professional point of view, since uh, Italy got such good ratings from, from the FATF evaluation. So uh, in terms of, the, of your question and the role of, the, um, uh, of risk assessment, probably I should, uh, I should uh, inevitably I will have to repeat some of the things that have been said before, but I think it's, uh, it's important uh, maybe to, to repeat them again. Uh, so what 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 was the um, uh, the uh, the reasoning behind uh, introducing this con concept of, of, of risk assessment uh, in the standard? Uh, I think uh, the the, f the first uh, uh, assumption that you that you make or the first uh, oh, sorry okay. uh, the uh, the first thing that you have to accept is that uh, you won't be able to catch uh, all of, of the all of the money laundering uh, just like uh, you cannot you can catch all of the crime and this is uh, exactly the question of uh, 
uh, this uh, proportion, what is the right proportion of, 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 of the money to be, to be caught. Um, and uh, I think starting from that recognition uh, that you cannot, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, prevent uh, this crime, then uh, this phenomenon, which is an inherently underground phenomenon, then you have to, you have to, uh, and given, given uh, the scarce resources that you have, and you, 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 you never have enough resources, that's, uh, again, another assumption that, that, that you have in mind. Uh, and uh, on that basis, uh, that was a quite a natural uh, idea that uh, you have to put the resources where they are most needed. Uh, so this is, this is the basically the underlying idea of the, of the risk-based approach, which is embedded in the FATF standard. And uh, risk assessment is only part of that, uh, of that concept. So uh, I think the, the starting point is the risk-based approach. Uh, for us, so I would I would probably start by saying uh, by stating this 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 uh, important idea. So um, uh, basically, you you put your effort, you put your resources where uh, the risks are the highest. Um, so in o but in order, of course, to understand uh, <coughs> where you need to put your resources, you need to understand the risk. And so this is where we we come to the idea of assessing assessing the risk. Um, uh, now, uh, what, what is the official, um, how, the, how does the FATF formulate its requirements concerning what countries should be doing uh, in that respect? And um, it is quite uh, tricky actually, because um, uh, what we're talking here is a national risk assessment. And uh, national risk assessment, is strictly speaking, is not a requirement of the FATF. What FATF requires to do is uh, to identify, assess, and understand money laundering risks. How you do it, it's up to you as a country. Uh, national risk assessment is one of the ways how you can do it one, but not the only one. Uh, and um, we have some, we have already uh, a body of uh, case studies or case law uh, uh, we, where we can, I think we can uh, point out some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of, the, of the approach uh, uh, in, uh, to assessing risk, which is a, a national risk assessment, the one overall risk assessment. Uh, and uh, I'll probably talk about a little bit later, but since we're, I'm just giving the idea of the role of the, uh, of the, of the risk assessment in the standard, uh, in the standards. So again, we have, uh, our standards are, uh, they consist of uh, uh, 40 recommendations and uh, we have a methodology to assess uh, uh, the compliance. So this is what it looks like, the methodology. It's quite actually quite thick uh, uh, book. Uh, and uh, the methodology consists of two elements, uh, of technical compliance and uh, effectiveness. <coughs> and uh, risk-based approach is embedded in, the, in both, but uh, definitely more important for the effectiveness assessment. And effectiveness assessment uh, is not that strictly s uh, uh, linked or tied to, to the individual te technical compliance uh, uh, requirements. It's, it's looking more how the system is functioning as a, as a, as a holistic uh, organism, let's put it like that. And we are looking at a number of distinct areas uh, uh, where we are trying to look at the value chains, you know. Uh, so we are looking at the super supervision. Uh, so from 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 the beginning till the end, you know, uh, we are looking at the financial investigations. We are looking at confiscation. We are looking at uh, terrorism financing investigations. So like a big broad chunks of the, of, of elements of the of the system. And here exactly, uh, this is where uh, the risk 
play the most important part. So actually, we, we start more or less from the, from the, from the end. So we look uh, at what are the, how, what the, uh, the operational agencies do in their, uh, in their day to day uh, jobs. Uh, is, is something that they are doing is commensurate with the risks? Is it, is it, are their activities, are their priorities aligned with the, with the national uh, uh, priorities or, or risks identified uh, uh, within the country? So, uh, and this is, this is a, a starting point from us. And then we go, more or less, we, go, we work backwards to, if, if we see that something is uh, wrong or is not consistent or uh, doesn't seem to be justified, then we work backwards and look, okay, what is the, what is the methodology that led to, that, to those conclusions? Uh, and uh, what were the, uh, the raw data that were uh, used uh, to feed into that methodology, you know? So we are working a little bit the other way around. Um, and uh, we, or should I say, we, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely not a scientific approach. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's like we are uh, starting off, uh, uh, actually the science is always looking for the truth, right? And uh, whatever, uh, however bitter it might, it might be. And we always start off by looking for the truth, but we end up by looking for a compromise in the end. Uh, <coughs> so uh, this is, uh, this is the, um, the, the reality of, 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 of uh, how we work. Um, uh, but uh, of course, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm strongly in favor of uh, the scientific approach. Uh, so, but the scientific approach uh, needs to rely on, on, on data uh, that are uh, uh, verifiable, that are reproducible, that, that you can uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, that you, you, you can look and assess yourself, right? Uh, so some, something that, that uh, adds the objective element. element. So, um, uh, and, um, and this is, this is th and uh, f from our perspective, this is where uh, uh, we are, we, are no, we have not reached that level in, in terms of the global community where we can have perfect data that we can rely on. So inevitably we, we, have, to, we have to rely uh, sometimes on qualitative assessments. And um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what would be the, the, the right moment to talk about some of the, uh, uh, how should I say, um, uh, some of the um, uh, initial uh, feedback from, from the first uh, assessments that we have had yeah. so far, but uh, probably this is the just a yeah. high-level yeah. introduction. Yeah, thanks for um, elaborating on, on the whole process. We can see that a risk assessment or the national risk assessment is just one part of a whole process that is much more complex. And in the end, is also, well, something looking for a compromise or ways to make the world a little bit better. Um, and it was interesting that you said, well, people think a national risk assessment or perhaps people in the room think this is a requirement that you need one national risk assessment. We have here countries like Italy, the Netherlands and the UK who have chosen for a national risk assessment. Um, and there are also other countries and in the afternoon there will be Sweden. Um, can you say something and perhaps also these countries, uh, what are the pros and cons of a national risk assessment? Because you say, well, it's also possible, and perhaps you can elaborate on that, other countries who don't do that, who don't uh, do a national risk assessment. Sure. Thank you. This is a, <coughs> this is a very good and uh, valid question from, from our perspective, because we have, uh, I think, this body of evidence that we, or case studies that we have uh, that allows us to, to say something uh, or to, to come to, s to some preliminary conclusions as to uh, what the advantages and the disadvantages of, uh, 
of, of those two approaches are. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, when we are talking about a single national risk assessment, what is, uh, uh, what are the, definitely what are the advantages of that I is that uh, those sorts of exercises, they are much easier to coordinate and prioritize. Uh, so once you, uh, it's, um, it might be challenging in the beginning to, uh, to agree and adopt uh, a single methodology, uh, but once you have done it, it's so much easier to coordinate uh, internally because actually coordination, interagency coordination is uh, one of the biggest issues uh, in, in, uh, in uh, FATF evaluations. And uh, uh, to some extent uh, it's uh, uh, just one of the easiest indicators of measuring effectiveness, frankly speaking. Uh, so to put it clearly, if countries have a national risk assessment, often they get a good evaluation. Uh, there is a correlation. <laughs> it's not a causal relation. But uh, no, I actually, um, I can't. I can't say this. No, because uh, no, not because I, I don't want to offer my my opinion on that. But uh, so far, unf unfortunately, we haven't seen that strong correlation that. Uh, national risk assessment will solve all, all your problems. And I will come back to the disadvantages. Yeah. And uh, now but the point you made was that if agencies in a country cannot collaborate, they are not able to make exa a national exactly. risk assessment. This is and this also is in other countries, it's a complex process yes. To, yes. to get this result. In also. scientific yeah. terms, this is necessary but not sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say it like that. Uh, so. So it's easier to coordinate and prioritize uh, once you have uh, conducted uh, an assessment. Uh, it gives you, in a way, a more holistic picture because, again, uh, of course, you start out with uh, an assessment with the idea to, to have a compre pr comprehensive study, so which will include uh, all possible sectors, you know, all possible geographies. So, so this is probably also something where the, the current model can be criticized. And I actually I offer, offer some other criticism as far as the model that we are talking about here, um, because I think it's, it is important to point out some of the, uh, uh, some of the things uh, about this model. Uh, so uh, it gives you a more holistic picture. Uh, and, um, mm, but the, the main problem with the single NRAs, uh, which might outweigh the advantages, is that if you are doing a single national risk assessment, you might uh, lose a lot of details. Because it is, it is such, a, such a big exercise, you tend to go very high level on that, uh, on, the, on the findings, on the outcomes, and you know, what we really don't want to see in a, in a national risk assessment when we, we are presented as an assessors with risk assessment is, a, is those uh, famous metrics, you know, with the red, the yellow, and green colors and saying like this is, uh, like, this is red, this is green. Because uh, the next question that we have is like, how is it useful for you? How, how, what are you going to do with, it, with, with such a, an outcome, such a finding? Okay, you say that your uh, banking sector is high risk. Okay, so uh, what do you do about it? Uh, so you lose details, and details is actually details are the most important part. So, and this is m maybe one of the. Uh, it's not really a criticism, but maybe an observation about the the methodology that is used here is that when you are trying to come up with some composite ratings, you know, when you do this lasagna thing, because. Uh, uh, you have you have these uh, various factors put together, and uh, you always have this question: how much of how much uh, sense makes does this uh, composite uh, rating make? Because this is exactly the, the de details that that are important. Because uh, the thing is that uh, in in re national risk assessment, uh, we have a lot of um, uh, we have a lot of uh, different stakeholders. 
we have uh, law enforcement, we have FIUs, we have uh, supervisors, we have uh, private sector, we have uh, some other uh, agencies that are not uh, strictly speaking uh, have, um, uh, have a stake in, in uh, money laundering or ter terrorism financing uh, uh, area, but still they, they might, be rel uh, might be important for the overall system. So, and uh, they might need different uh, types of outcomes from the risk assessment for their own needs. So the, the, out, uh, the finding or the, the, the way how you present results of the risk assessment uh, to supervisors, the, it will be completely different from how you would present the, the results for, uh, for, the, for police. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, you cannot give them one composite rating and say like, look, this is what you have and do, do something about it. No. Uh, uh, and this is, this is why uh, we, we think that national risk assessment have this important disadvantage. Risk of losing details. Uh, coming up with the high level composite uh, uh, ratings uh, or uh, profiles uh, or um, um, you know s some sort of uh, indicators something like that so this is the sometimes uh, the biggest uh, uh, deficiency which outweighs the, the all the advantages yeah so, so one of the advantages you have one document and also one process that people well make this risk assessment and think about it but you are clear in pointing out that there are many actors mm -hmm. who do different things. So you mentioned inspecting authorities, but also the private sector or the banks. Yes. They also have, well, in the afternoon we will talk about the risk assessment at banks. They have totally different risks and also other risks than money laundering. So this is a totally different context also in which money laundering risk assessment take, takes place. Um, well, the tax agencies or the the fiscal police depends a little bit on the, the countries, but many countries have normal police. And, well, you can also start investigations through, well, checking the books. And this is a different, well, sometimes they target also other types of crime. And you say that perhaps it's also possible to have a risk assessment by all these actors on their own, which are very practical for their own um, well, purposes, because they know how to act and how to weigh the risk. So that would be possible, that a every actor would have his or her own risk assessment and that you, well, wrap it up and then say, this is the national risk assessment. Um, are there examples of that? And perhaps also uh, Italy, the Netherlands and the UK can reflect a little bit on that because they have the national risk assessment say, well, you lose too much detail, perhaps. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or perhaps first the reflection of Italy, the Netherlands, and the UK, and then come back to you. Yes, was the question if uh, to have only one or more risk assessment was the question I was doing uh, when we negotiate the standards. <laughs> I was doing as Italy delegation to micro chairs. Uh, uh, but do you want at the end one document or, or do you want the perception that authorities has the perception of their risk? No, Because the document is just uh, a photograph, just a picture of that. And you are very right to, to say that uh, for our fast standards, REC 1 is on risk assessment, but REC 2 is little, but it's more important, is about coordination of authorities. We profit that from the fact that we have already, for different purposes and reasons, a financial security committee with all the relevant authorities, not only AML authorities, not only law enforcement, the Minister of Interior, Justice are there, but there is also custom, revenue, and so other, other kind of uh, authorities in there. And so we profit from that uh, to share this kind of comprehension. And I agree with you that uh, the national risk assessment is just a starting point because it should be a cascade effect in each authority. For example, in supervision, Bank of Italy has done after the evaluation, after the, what the assessor told us to, 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 to start to do a risk-based supervision. 
and uh, start to, to do supervision on banks, on aim outside, based on risk. And not only from risk uh, emerging from uh, the national risk assessment document, but the, the, the risk that they perceive in the everyday activity going banks to banks. So, and, and it's the same for law enforcement. For example, um, we have different law enforcement, as I said before, and uh, some law enforcement that are not very, you know, specialized in tracking financing of terrorism. Now we perceive in the last year that this kind of threats is emerging, and so they are shifting also to this kind of, uh, you know, new emerging uh, kind of investigation. So I think there is a process, bottom-down and top-down process, in the same, in the same way. So as government, as treasury, I have to, you know, to collect all this uh, kind of decision, I give a feedback. But I am very keen on giving also the obliged entities the recession they have to do their own risk assessment. For example, the, the, the financial intermediaries, the notaries, we have in Italy this kind of uh, category is very important to track uh, the beneficial ownership and to track the, the incorporation. Of, and so they have to do also their own risk assessment. And with the, the, new, the, the new directive, European directive, it is very clear. The risk-based approach is not only for governments, it's also for private sector. Hmm. All right, the Netherlands. Um, I would like to start by saying that we are the FATF. So he's not only the FATF, we are the FATF. Yeah. And we uh, um, decided with each other that it's necessary to do risk assessment. Um, that's what I want. Furthermore, I don't think there is one size fits all. You have to look at your country, the size of your country, the, the amount of uh, uh, parties involved. Uh, that's also very, uh, we have the advantage or sometimes disadvantage that we are a small country. So perhaps it's easier to coordinate one national uh, risk assessment. Um, at the end, it's not about a document that needs to be presented. Um, something needs to be presented that is practical and usable for all involved uh, parties. And those are very different parties, uh, supervisors, obliged entities. Um, what I think is very important that you go into a dialogue with the uh, different involved parties. And that is also uh, in the area of this, this pilot, uh, uh, looking at the business uh, sector. I think it's very important to, look with, uh, to talk with obliged entities. How can this help you? How further needs, to be, needs this to be developed? Uh, how more further do we go to in detail to make your life easier in detecting money laundering? Um, so I think um, no one size fits all. Uh, you have to go in dialogue with the different, different uh, uh, parties involved. And uh, you look at the, the, the usability, uh, the practical use of the end of the product. Yeah. Right, thank you. And the UK. Yeah, I'd just, um, <clears throat> I'd reiterate what I said earlier in sort of, in, 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 in the case of the UK, we had sort of several agencies all doing the same thing. We had the National Crime Agency who chase drug dealers and they chase child exploitation and they chase people trafficking and we have the customs people who chase drug traffickers who chase and then you have serious crime squads within police forces who do the same um, recognizing there's this unity now around working together the NRA for the UK identified a lot of these risks and we're able now to sort of actually start taking a step back who's best placed to actually deal with that and maybe pump more resources into those elements and we can come out and take them out. What, what it's also done, um, we're under, obviously we're under FATF inspection at the moment, um, next, it's to be published in, the, in, in two years time, but it's made us look at ourselves in terms of how we do business, how we communicate, and it's presented, for me personally, for my, it's presented an opportunity because some of the areas which have been identified where we're not gonna get potentially a good rating, already we're having to put measures in place around that. So. What are those measures going to be? Well, that's where your risk assessments come in because they can determine, based on the assessment, quantitative and qualitative. This will be our response to that, which hopefully will get us some sort of recognition from the FATF inspectors or are working towards. Thank you. So, Isabella, you said, well, we have a national risk assessment, but every actor is also responsible for his or her own risk assessment. So I wanted to ask you, 
other examples of countries where there's no national risk assessment where you think, well, they do a good job in doing something that is worthwhile, but they don't have a national risk assessment? Of course. Um, I, can, I can only comment on those assessments that have been Your completed. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so the, the best example is probably Spain, yeah. uh, where they didn't have a national risk assessment. Uh, and uh, where uh, they assess their risk uh, by conducting a series of uh, various sector-specific assessments, which were uh, carried out by different uh, agencies, but in coordination with other agencies. And this is what uh, made them successful. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, actually, I would like to reflect on one important point that that was made by uh, Mr. Sorry, concerning that uh, uh, the, the the document uh, uh, as a result of a risk assessment. Actually, there is exactly there is no requirement to have a document. Uh, you don't need it uh, uh, for uh, in order to to be able to satisfy the requirements of the of the of the standard and. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, for us uh, the measure uh, is uh, not uh, the document per se, but the, uh, how how the outcomes of the risk assessment are being implemented in the national uh, measures. So for us the the risk the, the the outcome is is uh, what what uh, how how the your regulations and legislation is is drafted and what you are doing in practice. And uh, uh, there is one important uh, consideration behind uh, having a document, which is uh, to maybe as a, as a first step, it, it is important just to uh, just to have a sort of a common vocabulary, some some common framework, some common understanding between different parties. But then I would say that you, if if you do, uh, you know, risks are a very dynamic uh, concept. They, they tend to change o over time. And uh, are you going to do this exercise, which might take a, a year, uh, and uh, to come up with a 200 uh, pages document? Are you going to do it every year or two years time? You know, uh, Ideally, you should be always up to date with your risks. So you probably will, at some point, you will need to find a, a more flexible approach than just issuing papers and documents, you know? S some, some sort of a committee, probably, which uh, meets on a regular basis and produces maybe some two, three pages bulletins, you know, uh, that would be um, uh, for, that would be tied or uh, tail tailored to a specific uh, topic or specific authority or something like that. So. There is um, there is no requirement to have uh, such a, you know one single document each time. So I think that was an important point to make. Yeah. So this is a continuing process also. So Isabella can be proud of uh, Italy, but uh, well, you have to work uh, on the on the new risk assessment, or it's a continuing process. Um, so I would like to ask all the people before lunch to go into the, the challenges we face for the future. So for some countries, they are under review or they are close to review or they have been reviewed already. And the FATF, this is all of you. Um, but what are the challenges, um, the most important challenges you see for these risk assessments in the future? The challenges are the outcomes of the assessment. So are the mitigation measures, because the standard says that we have to comprehend the, the risk and to understand very deeply the risk, not only the government side, but as I said, the obliged entity side. And then uh, after you have understood this risk, what have you done? This is the most important thing. And the first round of assessment, uh, it focused very much on the the comprehension side, so the tools, the, the methodology, and uh, but I think the the next round of uh, you know of um, of 
assessment of countries, also the, the middle assessment that we have to face after five years time would be the mitigation measures. So how in the system this kind of document or multiple documents uh, has done in the system? W what are the effectiveness of, of that document? The, 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 the outcomes for law enforcement, the outcomes for oblige entities, this is very challenging because uh, still needs a coordination, still needs a coordination among, uh, for example, law enforcement authorities, still needs a coordination among supervisory authorities because they are various supervisory authorities, not only, you know, central banks and IF, FIU, there are various sectors to, to be supervised. And the, 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 the maybe one of the challenges for professionals, because uh, IML now for financial intermediary is something that they, they get to know in their years. Uh, we have this kind of IML law, uh, now it's uh, 10 years, and, uh, and we are revising after the directive, but I think that the very challenge is the, the professional, the individuals, because they, they have not the tools uh, uh, and the, the sophisticated tools that financial intermediary has. And financial intermediary has also the, the illicit flows to look at because they have accounts to look at. But the poor professional, the challenge is very high because they have only the individuals and the, 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 you know, the papers that the individuals gave to them. And so I think the, the mitigation measure are uh, the, the other part that we have to face. So the most difficult part is yet to come. Mm. Yeah. Marco. Uh, challenges are, uh, I think, and, and I repeat myself, to, to stay practical, uh, to always go in dialogue with other involved uh, parties. Um, and by practical, I also mean um, in, in, in earlier presentations, there was a discussion about the, the, um, the data that are available to do uh, research. Um, of course, I understand that data are uh, very important to do research. But if my uh, minister tells me, you, know, you have, uh, as a policymaker, one million to spend on money laundering, and I, and I tell him, well, uh, uh, we could hire 10 people to collect data for a national risk assessment, I think he's, we, he will send a proposal back and he said, I want 10 people who uh, deal with money laundering cases. So we have to stay practical um, in a dialogue with other parties and we also have to uh, uh, focus and be innovative. For instance, these kinds of uh, academic researchers to uh, um, better understand risks and, and how to deal with them. Yes. And the challenges in the UK? I think uh, apart from the obvious ones of obviously legislation, jurisdiction, et cetera, for me, I think it's the, it's the risk, if you like, around the lack of recognition of the data they don't collect. Um, and then attribute that to the difficulties of information sharing between the public and private sector. I think all, all the speakers today had to drop certain elements of the, of the research because of the lack of data. Uh, as part of the mutual evaluation, we've, we've, you know, we've had requests for data which we don't have, and that clearly is going to be flagged up as a risk. Um, and it's only, it's only because of the inspection, the evaluation, that they've recognised the risk from not having, so they've not even done a risk assessment on the lack of data for a risk assessment, if that makes sense. Right, and the last word is for Sergei on the challenges for the countries and for the effort here. Um, yes, I, 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 I will probably have to inevitably to uh, repeat what has been said already. So um, uh, the biggest challenge is coordination uh, and uh, the lack of data. Yeah. So when there is lack of data, we basically we are led to assume that there is it's it's a high risk area. Uh, so uh, mm, and uh, there is one one important element which I probably missed, uh, I sh but I, I I really think I, I need to to underline it. This uh, the methodology that are used uh, in in this approach and. Uh, most of the countries so far use a, a similar approach in, 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 in what way? Um, a lot of emphasis is being put on uh, money that, are that is generated inside the country. And uh, uh, we haven't seen really, a, it, it might work for countries uh, that are not financial centers. 
but uh, that we have uh, we have a challenge of uh, uh, countries that are or jurisdictions that are financial centers uh, where domestic uh, crime uh, almost uh, does not exist so there is almost no money generated uh, domestically and you cannot use those uh, indicators or risk factors that you identified in, in your in your in your model and you cannot just apply because it would make a, you know, no sense and where the most ex exposure to risk actually comes from abroad and uh, this is so far I would say probably the other most important challenging uh, issue for uh, risk for a good risk assessment yeah we saw it in some of the regions of uh, the UK so the beautiful islands uh, but also in the Netherlands, it's, well, sometimes I say it's not a country, it's incoming and outflowing, uh, outgoing flows of drugs and money sometimes. Uh, and this is the risk you have to manage. Uh, and of course, uh, these are also challenges for these risk assessments. If they are national, well, there is also an international dimension in money laundering and also in investments and how to capture that. That's, I think, a very important question also. But another important thing is lunch. So I would like to uh, thank all the discussants for participating and the audience uh, for being here. And we have now time for lunch. And after the lunch, we go on with money laundering risk assessment in other countries and the private sector, which is also very important. Time for lunch. Thank you.